okay students in the last video we were discussing about what are hardness what are the reason what are the salts responsible for hardness and what are the categories of hardness temporary and permanent and how to estimate or uh, calculate the total hardness using EGTA isn't it now in this video we will discuss about what are the disadvantages of hard water and why we have to get rid of hard water okay so if you discuss about you see the drawbacks or disadvantages of hard water we can categorize it into two types domestic use and industrial use in domestic use we are, we are going to use for washing purpose for bathing purpose drinking and cooking if you use for washing the utensils or the cloth will be stained if you use hot water because the hot water has different types of dissolved salts in it while bathing as i said already the soap will not lather easily instead of lather instead of getting foam you will be getting precipitate or scum this is a great disadvantage of using hard water for bathing drinking again it's not advisable for drinking hard water hard water has so many dissolved salts which may cause damage to the digestive tract and also it may result in urinary stones kidney stones and if you use hot water which means hardness producing salts which are dissolved in water when used for cooking the time taken will be very long because the fuel consumption is high and cooking will not be because the dissolved salts will elevate the boiling point of the water hence cooking may be getting delayed okay if you talk about the industrial use any industry if you take uh, without water you can't run an industry so the industrial water should be very soft which means it should not have any dissolved salts in it what happens if you take textile industry in textile industry if you use, use hot water the textiles for washing or uh, for uh, treating any textile you if you use hot water this is the hardness producing salts are there that will give you um, unwanted shades unwanted spots in the textiles okay in sugar industry the crystallization of sugar will not be achieved much instead of getting sugar in a perfect crystals cubic crystals you will be getting the sugar as a powdered form in dyeing industry if you use hot water the expected color of the dye cannot be achieved because the hardness producing salts will react with your dye and if you are expecting a purple color you will end up with a why uh, blue blue color or any red color okay paper industry if you use hot water the final glossy nature of the paper will not be achieved and also the paper will not be very smooth it will be also having a not very pure white but it will be having some dull color in pharmaceutical industries which produces our life-saving medicines of course we have to use not only soft water but also demineralized water okay um, last one in steam generation in boilers this is the main industrial use we are going to discuss in our syllabus okay we are going to discuss uh, what is the problem what are the problems may arise when we use boiler feed water as a hot water okay so this is called boiler troubles where are boilers used you can see boilers are the one which are using liters and liters of water and when it is boiled steam is produced that steam produced is taken out for power generation for fruit processing industries for feed industry textile industries for paper industry etc okay so when you take water hot water in a boiler and continuously use it for steam generation the salts will be depositing on the inner surface of the boilers and that will cause many boiler troubles what are the boiler troubles we can see scales and sludges formation of scales and sludges priming and foaming caustic embrittlement boiler corrosion these are the main four boiler troubles faced by the boilers if hot water is used as a boiler feed water okay uh, what is sludge and scale um, i'll explain it to you in with by taking an example so you have observed uh, if you keep a mug immersed in a 
tub of tub, tub of water overnight okay just imagine or you have you have, i think you have experienced also if you keep your plastic mug immersed in water full of uh, tub full of water and you leave it for overnight the next morning if you lift the mug you will feel your slippery precipitate on the surface outer surface of the mug have you noticed that that is called sludge okay so sludge is a soft loose slimy precipitate formed inside the boiler during the steam generation the reason for sludge formation is the salts like magnesium carbonate magnesium chloride magnesium sulfate calcium chloride etc and the main reason for sludge formation is the cooler i mean it, it, it will occur only in the cooler portions as i said the mug and the tub of water and it is left for overnight because the temperature is very low at overnight isn't it so sludges are also formed in the cooler portions of the boiler so what is sludge sludge is a soft loose slimy precipitate formed due to the salts magnesium carbonate magnesium chloride magnesium sulfate and calcium chloride and they usually occur at cooler parts of the boiler but they can be easily removed just you can see that plastic mug if you rub it with hand with uh, lay hand you can remove the sludge isn't it that that uh, slippery precipitate will is uh, will be vanished so sludges can be easily scraped off with a wire brush what is scale for scale also i'll give you an example have you experienced when you boil water in your house you take a beaker you have water even you boil and you forget to off it in time and it will be getting dried up and you can see the inner surface of the beaker will be covered with a white strongly adherent precipitate you cannot remove it by rubbing with a brush also okay that much strong precipitate will be adhered sticking to with the inner surface of the what i mean the beaker have you observed that that is called scale so scale is a hard adherent coating forms inner forms on the inner walls of the boiler during the steam generation and the reasons for the scale formation are calcium bicarbonate calcium sulfate silicon dioxide etc present in the boiler feed water okay you can see here sludges are nothing but loose slimy precipitate the reason is i have given what are the okay sludges form so what is the problem the main problem with sludges it is a poor conductor of heat so it will not allow the water inside the boiler to get heated up and steam generation is not is affected okay excess of sludge if formed it may also sometime choke the in i mean the pipelines of the boiler how to prevent it only thing is you have to use soft water you have to remove the hardness producing salts and you have to use soft water in the boilers okay another one is by you uh, frequent blow down operation what is blow down operation when you for example if you have 1000 liters of water in you know, the boiler after production of steam when the volume of the water is reduced to around uh, 50 liters or say 75 liters you stop heating and you just throw the 75 liters of water outside because after water is being converted into steam the salts are highly concentrated in that 75 liters of water so in that 75 liters of water if you add excess of water fresh water that salt will be remaining there itself so often and then then and there you have to remove the bulk of water at the end so that it will not contaminate again and again this operation is called blow down operation so by uh, using soft water you can prevent the sludge formation and frequent blow down operation also you can avoid the sludge formation similarly scale formation uh, i have said that hard adherent precipitate is responsible for scales it's called scales and the salts responsible are calcium carbonate magnesium hydroxide calcium sulfate calcium silicate magnesium silicates etc what are the reason for that when you have bicarbonates in your boiler feed water boiler feed water is the water fed in the boiler for steam generation okay so the boiler feed water if contains calcium bicarbonate and in the prevailing temperature it will be deposited as calcium carbonate 
Similarly, magnesium bicarbonate will be deposited as magnesium hydroxide. These two are nothing but scales. Okay. Then, if you use calcium sulfate, that calcium sulfate on high boiling point will, will be precipitated out as calcium sulfate scales. And also, if you have magnesium salts like magnesium chloride, it will react with water in the prevailing temperature, producing magnesium hydroxide, which is again your scale. Not only that, the byproduct, another product which is formed is HCl that also will involve in the boiler corrosion. Then if silica, silica is mud or uh, sand is present in water, along with your calcium and magnesium salts, then correspondingly calcium silicate, magnesium silicates will be formed, which is nothing but again scales. These scales will adhere very strictly, I mean stick very firmly with the inner surface of the boilers and these are also very bad conductors of heat and electricity, heat actually, so that the boiler uh, when heated will not, this, these scales present in the inner surface of boiler will not allow the heat to reach the water and steam generation is affected. Similarly, lowering of boiler safety, it will lead to lowering of boiler safety, decrease in boiler efficiency and sometimes the pressure monitoring is also very difficult in such uh, scale formations because what happens there will be some cracks or um, holes in the, not holes actually the uh, scales will be having here and there some cracks in that cracks if the water directly comes in touch with the hot boiler surface then suddenly high pressure will be created high steam will be uh, evolved and this high steam will lead to uh, Moni variation in the pressure and may uh, uh, temperament uh, lead to, uh, to the danger of explosion. Explosion also may occur. Why? The, see for example, if you have used the uh, same uh, beaker for uh, um, milk, for heating the milk, preheated uh, vessel, again you are using for fresh milk to be heated. Then you, you will be noticing top top sound like that, so like popping sound. The reason is the scale. Scale is nothing but the, uh, no, what you can say, the settled milk at the bottom in the old vessel and fresh milk you are using. The old milk will be having some cracks. The settled old milk uh, layer will having some cracks. Now in that crack, if the new milk added will come in contact with the vessel, okay, open vessel, the heat will be very much felt and that is the reason for that pop sound. Similarly, in the big boiler, there are a full boiler is covered with scales if suppose and if the scales are having so many cracks, then the water will come in contact with the boiler surface through the scales and that will be immediately boiled and a large number of uh, steam will be evolved at once. That will may, that may lead to the boiler explosion. So, it is very dangerous scales formation and uh, along with scale and sludge both they combine they may block the or choke the pipelines also. So, we have to remove the scales. Removal of scales can be done by rubbing very heavily with wire brush or by giving thermal shock. Thermal shock is nothing but heating the boiler along with water to high temperature and suddenly reducing the temperature or cooling the boiling water. So, what happens? Sudden rise of temperature and sudden cooling will make the scales come out of the uh, surface of the boiler. The water it will that is uh, it will leave the surface of the boiler and come out as uh, solid precipitate. You can remove it later, or you can use some chemicals. For example, if you have calcium carbonate scales, you can use uh, five to ten percent HCl solution, or if you have calcium sulfate scales, you can use EDTA solutions to wash the scales off, or you can also follow the blow down operation. Okay, so this picture shows you how the sludges and scales are formed inside the boiler tubes. Okay, so these are the disadvantages of uh, scales and sludges, nothing but wastage of fuel, lowering of boiler safety and efficiency and it leads to boiler failure. The third boiler trouble is priming and foaming. What is priming? When steam is produced rapidly in the boilers, some droplets of the liquid water are carried along with the steam. This process of wet steam formation is called priming. 
for example you are going to heat a water in a beaker at first small small bubbles will be formed inside the beaker later the water starts boiling and steam will come out and when you still continue heating or still continue the boiling the emerging steam will also carry the droplets of water from the beaker have you observed that this is called priming so formation of wet steam is called priming okay what are the reasons for the priming high steam velocity okay steam is escaping with high velocity or large amount of dissolved salts so if the water boiler feed water is having large number of dissolved salts then it is also responsible for causing of priming and improper boiler design is also a reason and very high water level and also sudden boiling of water these are the five reasons for priming how to prevent it you can have to control the velocity of steam or you have to keep the water level lower and you should have good boiler design and most importantly you should use soft water what is foaming formation of stable bubbles above the surface of water is called foaming these bubbles are carried along with steam leading to excessive priming what is the meaning of it see if you start by if your water is having the boiling water if it is having some organic matter or some oil on the surface then bubbles will start appearing foams like foams it will come and it will the foams sorry foams uh, thickness will be going on rising the bubbles will grow in its size for small beaker itself it's the problem just imagine in big boilers which is used which are used in industries which are carrying thousands and thousands liters of water in such type if you have any organic impurities or any dissolved salts and foaming starts appearing then what happens the level of water cannot be monitored if the level of water is not able to monitor we cannot judge the pressure present inside okay so pressure monitoring becomes very difficult and this leads to uh, explosion of boiler priming and foaming will always go hand in hand if there is priming continuous uh, wet steam formation that will form foams and if foaming is there naturally priming will be followed due to priming and foaming the problem main problem is the steam will enter along with the steam the wetness will also enter into the turbine blades okay that wetness or the water droplets may contain hardness producing salts in uh, time being the hardness producing salts when water evaporates the hardness producing salts will be deposited on the turbine blades so it will be it's not only a problem for boiler priming is not only a problem of boiler but it is the problem throughout the pipeline turbine blades etc okay so what are the causes for priming and foaming presence of oil grease etc how to prevent it by adding coagulants like sodium aluminate sodium hydroxide ferrous sulfate etc and also you can add anti foaming chemicals such as castor oil and synthetic polyamides so this is the diagram representing priming and foaming see in priming the water level is taken uh, much lower than the pipeline through which the steam has to escape but if priming is there so much bubbles are there so much um, wet steam is there then that wet steam will go through the pipeline and will reach up to the turbine blades and in the second drawing you can see second uh, picture is showing you foaming so there are many foams formed due to the dis dissolved salts or due to some organic matter and boiling heavy boiling foams are formed so this foam will not allow you to monitor the water level and if water level is not able to be monitored the pressure above the water level cannot be adjusted okay we cannot have any idea where is the water level and where how much pressure is there inside so that may lead to boiler explosion okay now disadvantages are it reduces the efficiency of the boiler it is difficult to maintain proper pressure inside the boiler so wastage of fuel will occur actual water level cannot be accessed and this may also create corrosion this dissolved salts due to settling through priming in the turbine blades the turbine blades also gets corroded next problem is caustic embrittlement what is caustic embrittlement caustic embrittlement is nothing but the due to caustic I mean sodium carbonate which is present in hot water 
will be converted into sodium hydroxide in water. Okay. How the sodium carbonate comes inside the water? When we use softening process in softening process by lime soda process, some excess sodium carbonate may be left over in the water itself. And that water, when react, when that sodium carbonate, when reacts with water, produces sodium hydroxide. Okay, this sodium hydroxide is called caustic. Caustic in the sense, uh, this will create some um, corrosion. How it is creating? The sodium hydroxide has a peculiar character of getting infiltered in hairline cracks. Usually, the inner surface of the boiler, there will be so many hairline cracks. Okay. In that hairline cracks, this sodium hydroxide may enter. It has a peculiar character, I said. It is getting infiltered by through capillary action or by capillary action. It is getting into the minute hair cracks. And when the uh, solution evaporates, I mean the solvent evaporates, the salt, namely sodium hydroxide salt is uh, deposited there and it will start corroding the iron surface around it. Okay. And actually what is happening, a concentration cell format is formed like iron at the bends, joints, usually this crack or the uh, caustic embrittlement occurs in the reverts, bends and joints. Why? There will be many cracks in the bends and joints, there will be some cracks and sodium hydroxide will in get infiltered over that. So iron, iron is nothing but the body, boiler body, okay, made up of iron. Iron at reverts, bends and joints will be in connection with concentrated sodium hydroxide solution. The small hair crack has higher amount of sodium hydroxide solution when compared to the bulk of, uh, bulk of water present in the boiler which is having dilute sodium hydroxide solution. This is in contact with the boiler body. So this now forms a electrochemical cell or concentration cell. Because of this, now, iron at reverts, bends, etc. will now act, starts acting as anode and that will be starting corroded. First, the hairline crack will be corroded. So, that cracks will be becoming bigger and bigger and later, entire part of the body, boiler body will be getting corroded. So, this is co not called corrosion, rather it is called as caustic embrittlement because this embrittlement that is uh, going the boiler body is going in the form of uh, minute salts are called are caused due to the caustic nature of NaOH. So, this is called caustic embrittlement. Now, to avoid this caustic embrittlement, you can either use sodium phosphate as a softening agent. First, I said sodium carbonate was used as a softening agent which remained in the water and hence that was the reason for producing NaOH. Instead of sodium carbonate, if you use sodium phosphate as a softening agent, you will not, uh, that will not lead to the formation of NaOH in the later, later stages, isn't it? Next, adding tannin lignin to the boiler water. These things, what they will do, these are the polymers, isn't it? So, these will go and block the hairline cracks. So, if the hairline cracks are blocked, then the sodium hydroxide or the caustic soda will not enter or infiltrate in the cracks and embrittlement can be avoided. Third, third way to avoid is by adding sodium sulphate to boiler water. Okay, You can extra chemical is added, namely the sodium sulphate. This added sodium sulphate, this also has a peculiar character of getting infiltered in the hairline crack. Instead of sodium hydroxide getting infiltered, which is a very dangerous one because it causes caustic embrittlement, this sodium sulphate will go and uh, block the hairline cracks and hence can avoid uh, caustic embrittlement. So, by these three methods, you can avoid the caustic embrittlement. Next topic is the boiler corrosion. Boiler corrosion can happen because of three reasons. One, because of dissolved oxygen. Two, is because of dissolved carbon dioxide. And three, is because of the acids from the dissolved salts. Let us discuss one by one. Okay, boiler corrosion is nothing but decay of boiler material by a chemical or electrochemical attack by its environment. Main reasons are first dissolved oxygen. How comes dissolved oxygen in that boiler feed water? Generally, 8 ml of dissolved oxygen is present per liter of water at room temperature. Okay, we no need to add dissolved oxygen. 
generally in general 8 ml of dissolved oxygen is present per liter of water in room temperature. This dissolved oxygen in water at the prevailing high temperature corrodes the metal part. See iron it is the boiler body plus water is present always and the dissolved oxygen if it is there of course it will be there and you are going to get ferrous hydroxide in the first step. This ferrous hydroxide then further reacts with the dissolved oxygen to give rust Fe2O3 to H2O. Okay. So, how to remove this dissolved oxygen? We cannot avoid the dissolved oxygen because as per rule 8 ml around 8 ml will be present per liter. So, how to remove the dissolved oxygen? You can either add sodium sulphide or hydrazine or sodium sulphide. Let us see the equation. First one is sodium sulphide Na2SO3. This will remove the oxygen in the form of sodium sulphate. Hydrazine N2H4. This will also remove the dissolved oxygen and final product formed is nitrogen and water. And sodium sulphide Na2S. This will remove oxygen as sodium sulphate. Among the three which is the best? Hydrazine is the best because it is not imparting any salt like sodium sulphate. Okay. Next is boiler corrosion due to dissolved carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide with water forms carbonic acid. Acid the name itself tells it is an acid so it will corrode. It has a corrosive effect generally. So carbon dioxide is there. If carbon dioxide is there in water it will be in the form of carbonic acid and it will slowly corrode the boiler material. So how to remove that carbon dioxide? First one you have to add ammonia, calculated quantity of ammonia. Once you add ammonia that will be uh, in the form of ammonium hydroxide. Okay, Ammonium hydroxide will consume all the carbon dioxide and convert it into ammonium carbonates. Another one is mechanical aeration. Both the dissolved oxygen and dissolved carbon dioxide can be removed by mechanical aeration process. It is nothing but a huge tank with the, uh, in which you are going to pour the water uh, containing dissolved oxygen, dissolved carbon dioxide. Okay. Now that whole, be, whole uh, tank is being uh, evacuated or a, a vacuum is applied, high temperature is applied and high pressure is applied. Because of these three categories, the water which is uh, flowing through that uh, huge tank with mechanical agitation will bubble out the dissolved oxygen and dissolved carbon dioxide and only de-aerated water will be collected at the bottom. This is the physical method of removing oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now the third reason for the boiler corrosion is acid from dissolved salts. Okay. Now if magnesium chloride is present in your hard water, what happens? It will produce magnesium hydroxide plus 2 HCl. This hydrochloric acid will again react with your boiler body namely iron and FeCl2 is formed. This FeCl2 reacts with water in the next step forming Fe ferrous hydroxide plus two more hydrogen chloride is liberated out. This will attack in chain like reaction producing H HCl again and again and hence the boiler body namely the iron gets corroded. So this is about boiler corrosion. So, due to this reason, because of uh, caustic embrittlement, boiler corrosion, scales and sludge formation, priming and foaming, these will affect our boiler. We have to soften the water before feeding into the boiler. So, this process is called softening of hard water. There are two types of uh, softening uh, treatments. One is internal treatment method. The second one is external treatment method. Okay. So, softening of hard water. We have both external and internal treatment. External treatment has lime soda process, zeolite process and ion exchange. But in our syllabus, we have only ion exchange process. Internal conditioning treatment, there are physical and chemical methods. In chemical method, you can see carbonate conditioning, phosphate conditioning, halgon conditioning, sodium aluminate conditioning and complexometric method. In physical, you have colloidal conditioning and electrical conditioning. Okay, we will see one by one. Carbonate conditioning. It is very simple. Okay. Calcium sulphate is present in water, your hot water. 
that will form scales. So what you are going to do, you are going to add sodium carbonate, this is called carbonate conditioning. Calculated quantity of sodium carbonate is added. What happens now? Calcium sulphate which was about to form a scale and it is very difficult to remove, it will be converted into calcium carbonate which is a loose sludge can be removed by blow down operation. Okay. Second one is phosphate conditioning. The name itself tells what the phosphates are added. So, if you have calcium sulphate, magnesium chloride, these will be producing scales in your boilers. So, to avoid that, you are going to add sodium phosphates to it and so that sodium phosphate reacts with calcium sulphate to convert it into calcium phosphate, magnesium chloride is converted into magnesium phosphate. These are nothing but non-adherent soft sludges which can be removed by blow down operation. Here the sodium phosphate is available in three forms. One is mono uh, hydrogen uh, phosphate, mono hydro hydrogen phosphate, uh, dihydrogen phosphate and sodium phosphate as such. Okay. See here NaNH2, uh, NaH2PO4 is acidic in nature, Na2HPO4 is weakly alkaline in nature and three, Na3PO4 is alkaline in nature. Here you can you have to choose which sodium phosphate you have to add by depending upon the alkalinity or acidity of the boiler feed water. Next internal treatment is Calgon conditioning. Calgon is nothing but sodium hexametaphosphate. It prevents scale and sludge formation. Both are removed. Okay. So Calgon is nothing but Na2. You can see the Calgon formula here. It is a complex. Once you put in the water, Na plus is coming out and uh, Na4, PO3, 6, 2 minus is acting as an anion. This will react with calcium sulphate which is a scale forming salt and it will convert it into calcium soluble complex of calcium. Okay, This will be uh, very soluble and it will not form any scale or sludge. Scales are also avoided, uh, scale formation is avoided and also sludge formation is avoided. You can see, you can use this Calgon tablet, tablets for cleaning your washing machines, okay, washing machine drums. Then comes the sodium aluminate. Sodium aluminate when reacted with water first produces sodium hydroxide and another product is gelatinous aluminium hydroxide. What happens? Magnesium chloride which is a hardness scale forming salt when reacts with sodium hydroxide which is a byproduct of sodium aluminate in water will give magnesium hydroxide plus NaCl. Now, both the magnesium hydroxide and aluminium hydroxide are gelatin in, gelatin in nature and they will add as a coagulants and trap all the hardness producing substances and settles at the bottom. Then fifth one is complexometric method. Here what you are going to do, you, add, you are going to add is 1.5% alkaline EDTA solution to the boiler feed water. Whatever cation is there, Ca2+, plus, Ng2+, plus, whatever it is, it will form complex with EDTA metal. We have seen this already, estimation of total hardness in the last video. Okay, That will form metal EDTA complex and it is highly soluble. It will not form any scales and smudges. Physical methods, colloidal conditioning. What happens in low pressure boilers, if you add kerosene, tannin and agar agar, these are some gels, it will stick with the loose deposits of hardness producing substances and it will be settling down at the bottom and later it can be removed by blow down operation. Electrical conditioning, sealed bulbs, serial bulbs you have seen. So similarly, the sealed bulbs will contain small amount of mercury in it and if you connect it to an electric charge, the mercury will continuously emit electrical discharge and this electrical discharge will prevent scale forming particles to uh, stick in the uh, inner surface of the boiler. Inner surface of boiler, the scales will be sticking, adhering uh, strictly I said no, that will be prevented due to the continuous emission of electric discharge from these mercury bulbs. Now, next we will see about the external treatment. In our syllabus, we have ion exchange process for the softening of water. So, external treatment. Ion exchange resin. We are going to use some resin, okay. Cation exchange resin, anion exchange resin in a 
uh, huge uh, cylinders so that cations like Ca2+, calcium plus and calcium 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus are removed and anions like carbonates, bicarbonates, chlorides and sulfates are also removed. We have to see one by one. In cation exchange resin, you have the resin is made up of styrene, divinyl, benzene, copolymer which on sulfonation. You can see at the end sulf sulfur, um, here you can see SO3 minus and H plus, isn't it? This H plus is loosely attached. This H plus is capable of exchanging with calcium 2 plus or magnesium 2 plus. So, totally R is nothing but resin. H, H plus indicates cation that is loosely attached H plus which is ready to exchange with calcium or magnesium cations. This is called cation exchange resin. Okay, next is R, I mean, uh, anion exchange resin. This is indicated as ROH. Again, this is made up of styrene, divinyl, benzene. And at the bottom, you can see there are OH minus ions in each ring. They are loosely held. These OH minus anions are loosely held and they can be exchanged with chlorides, sulfates, carbonates and bicarbonates, those are anions, okay, which are present in the hardness producing salts. Now, this is the actual diagram of the exchanger. See, in this, there are two huge tanks. The first tank has cation exchange resin, okay. The second tank has anion exchange resin. Now, the raw water, which is having hardness producing salts, are first poured into the cation exchange column. What happens here? In the cation exchange resin, so much of H plus are available. Loosely attached, easily replaceable H plus are attached, isn't it? So, when the water containing calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride is entering, the Ca2 plus and Mg2 plus are trapped in the cation exchange resin and H plus are kicked out or knocked out, okay. So, the outcoming, the water which is coming out of the resin now is free of cations like calcium and magnesium. But anions are still there in the water along with H plus ions also which are knocked from the resins, okay. Now, this is taken and poured into the anion exchange column. Now, this anion exchange column is rich of hydroxyl ions, OH minus ions. Now, the sulfates and chlorides which are anions when enter into the column, what happens? The OH are knocked out and sulfate and chlorides are trapped inside. Okay. Now, the outcoming water is entirely free of cations and anions but rich in H plus and OH minus. Again, that also forms water and the outcoming water is finally demineralized water or called deionized water. It is not having any cation or any anion, only pure water. Okay. How long this will be working? One, until there are replaceable H plus ion, the cation exchange resin will work. And until replaceable OH minus ions are there, the anion exchange resin will work. And there will be a stage uh, uh, occurred where there are no more H plus in cation and no more OH minus in anion. That stage is called exhausted stage. At that time, you cannot just throw the resin out because the resins are very costly, biopolymers. So, you have to regenerate it. You have to regenerate it. Give the uh, H plus to it and OH minus to it. This is called regeneration. How it is done? You are going to spray dilute HCl in the cation exchange column. What happens then? The H plus from the acid will get trapped in the resin, knocking out the calcium and magnesium as magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, which is removed through sink. Similarly, anion exchange resin is regenerated by spraying with sodium hydroxide, dilute NaOH. This NaOH, when falling on the anion exchange resin, the OH will be trapped again in the resin. Whereas the chlorides and sulfates will be coming out as sodium chloride and sodium sulfates, which will be removed in the as a zinc, which will be removed as a waste in the 
zinc ok. So, this is the process. So, you can see here RH plus Na or calcium Ca2 plus gives first what is happening in the cation exchange resin is this. When you add raw water the resin is trapping or arresting the calcium ions and H plus is left out. Whereas in the anion exchange resin when you add a, a resin ROH is there when you add water which is having chlorides and sulfates the chlorides and sulfates are arrested or combining with the resin and OH minus are knocked out. Finally the H plus and OH minus are given as water. Now regeneration process what happens? You can see RNA plus you can consider this as Ca2 plus when you spray it with HCl the H plus is again combining with the resin and your RH plus is regenerated. Cation exchange resin is regenerated. Similarly when you sp uh, spray NaOH in your anion exchange resin this Cl is knocked out and ROH the anion uh, exchange resin is again regenerated. So, there are some advantages, advantages is both uh, anions and cations are completely removed. It is 100% deionized and demineralized water. Limitation if you see it is somewhat costly, okay. Maintenance is uh, also uh, somewhat problem. You have to maintain the resin and you have to regenerate it. Then the method is not suitable if heavy metals are present, okay. So, this is about the external treatment of hard water and this water is made soft. Next comes disinfection. So far what you have seen is presence of hardness producing salts in water which is causing so many problems for the boilers and how to soften it using internal treatment and external treatment. Now we are coming to a point where pathogenic bacteria are present in water. This pathogenic bacteria will affect our health, isn't it? So what is disinfection? and how it is done we are going to see. What are the requirements of drinking water first we should know. It should be free from odor, color and taste. It should be free from any dissolved and objectionable gases and it should be slightly alkaline around 8.0 pH should be 8 ok and it should be free from pathogens like bacteria, virus etc. It should not be toxic or it should not be turbid. These are the basic requirements of water. Now disinfection, what is disinfection? Removal of or killing of the pathogenic bacteria are called disinfection. Now this disinfection, the general way which we practice domestically is boiling the water heavily, okay. Uh, at 100 degrees and above plus or minus 5 degrees, when you boil the water heavily and cool it and filter it, you, all the disease causing pathogenic bacteria are killed and removed. But this method cannot be applied in municipalities for huge uh, liters of water, ok. Uh, large tanks are there which will store the drinking water for later release into for the public, ok. So here boiling is not possible. So what is the method of disinfection followed by municipalities for large scale chlorination. Chlorination is done by adding either bleaching powder or chloramines or liquid chlorine gas, liquid chlorine or gas chlorine. Actually what happens, the chlorine when reacts with water, when dissolved in water, either in the form of bleaching powder or chloramines, whatever it is, the chlorine will dissolve in water, produces HOCl, hypochlorous acid. This hypochlorous acid is the powerful disinfecting agent. It is a high oxidizing, powerful oxidizing agent. It will enter into the nucleus of the pathogenic bacteria and oxidize it and kill it, okay. The basic reason for disinfection is HOCl, hypochlorous acid which is obtained by reaction of chlorine and water, okay. Ozone treatment is there. We have to bubble ozone. Ozone once it is bubbled into water, it splits into oxygen and nascent oxygen. O2 is ordinary oxygen. Oxygen in the square bracket we know it is nascent oxygen. It is a powerful oxidizing agent. This ox nascent oxygen will oxidize or enter the nucleus and burst the nucleus of the pathogenic bacteria. Another method is UV light. When you uh, irradiate with the water with the 250 4 nanometer UV light, 
the RNA and DNA of the microorganisms are destroyed and thus the pathogenic bacteria are killed. Now, in this disinfection, an important uh, point is there, breakpoint chlorination. It's a very important topic, often asked question, okay. What is breakpoint chlorination? I will read that definition. It is a point where all the impurities present in water such as reducing compounds, organic compounds, ammonia are oxidized by the chlorine and the chlorine added further acts as disinfectant to kill the pathogens. I will explain it. See, when you start adding bleaching powder or chloro, I mean, uh, chloramines to disinfect, okay. First, the all the added bleaching powder or all added chloramines will not immediately start the disinfecting actions. Disinfecting action is what? Killing the pathogenic bacteria. Okay. At the first stage itself, the disinfection is not started. Whereas, what happens? Observe the graph. I have shown applied chlorine on the x-axis, residual chlorine on the y-axis. Now, from the starting point to the point A, whatever chlorine you are applying, will be consumed for destruction of reducing compounds present in the raw water. Raw water has many reducing compounds. Okay. So, from starting point to A, this much amount of applied chlorine is utilized for destruction of reducing compounds. Later, still you add, if you add the chlorine content bleaching powder, the curve A to B shows the chlorine is utilized, the added chlorine is utilized for the formation of chloroorganic and chloramines. Organic matters are present in water. The added chlorine will now combine with the organic matter and ammonia present in water and formation of chloramines and chloroorganic matter occurs. That is since that is a formation, the curve is going up. So, the A to B the applied dosage of chlorine is utilized for formation of chloramines and chloroorganic compounds. After that, still if you add the chlorine, the applied chlorine is utilized for destruction of these chloroorganic compounds and chloramines. The A to B, they are formed. B to C, they are destructed. Since there is destruction, the curve is shown as downward. Okay. So, till now I repeat. From O0 to A, the added chlorine is used for reducing, destruction of reducing compounds present in water. A to B, it is used for formation of chloroorganic compounds and chloramines. B to C, it is used for destruction of the chloroorganic compounds and chloramines. And the point C, at that point C, uh, residual chlorine, free residual chlorine is liberated. That point C is called break point chlorination because from that point alone the free applied chlorine is free and acts with water to form hypochlorous acid and involves in disinfection action. So, what is break point chlorination? The point at which free chlorine is liberated after the three jobs are done. What are the three jobs? Reduction, destruction of reducing compounds present in water, formation of chloroorganic and chloroamines and destruction of it. All the three jobs are over and the point from at which free chlorine is liberated for disinfection action is called the break point chlorination. You have to apply the chlorine dosage up to you reach the break point chlorination. Okay. So, this is again explained A to B uh, what is happening. Chloram, uh, hypochlorous acid re reacts with ammonia forming chloramines and uh, with organic matter it forms organo chloroorganic compounds. B to C, the reduction is done and the C, breakpoint chlorination, all the reducing organic substances of ammonia are oxidized and the residual chlorine acts as disinfectants to destroy the pathogens. Beyond the C, the total residual chlorine acts as disinfectant. Okay. Next to the last topic we are going to see is desalination of desalination of brackish water by reverse osmosis. What is brackish water? Sea water is called brackish water. Any water which is having highest dissolved salt content is called brackish water. Okay. How to uh, desaline? Desalination is removal of salt from water is known as desalination. 
so many methods like thermal distillation, electrodialysis, reverse osmosis are applicable and uh, in our syllabus we have only desalination by reverse osmosis method. So before knowing what is reverse osmosis, you should know what is osmosis. When two compartments containing solutions of different concentration, one is low concentration, one is another high concentration, if they are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, solvent moves from lower concentration to higher concentration side. For example, you are taking grapes, okay, dry grapes if you put in water. Dry grapes, inside dry grapes, salt content is high. Outside dry grapes, the water is there, salt content is very low. So, concentration is high in dry grapes, concentration of salts are low in water. Now, what happens? Solvent, namely the water moves from low concentration to high concentration. That is, water is getting inside the dry grapes and the dry grapes are becoming swollen up. This process is called osmosis. Okay, due to low, uh, solvent movement from low concentration to high concentration through a semi-permeable membrane, it is called osmosis. Then what is reverse osmosis? When two compartments containing solution of different concentrations are separated by a semi-permeable membrane and if I apply a hydrostatic pressure greater than the osmotic pressure on the concentrated side, then solvent starts moving from higher concentration to lower concentration. Okay, for example, this is the setup of reverse osmosis. See, and that upper uh, compartment, I am going to take brackish water, that is sea water, which is having high concentration of salt. In the lower compartment, pure water, which is having low concentration of salt. Both the compartments are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Okay, if as such, if you leave it without applying any pressure, due to osmosis, the solvent, that is water from pure side will go through, will be uh, going through the semi-permeable membrane and reach the top compartment. This is called osmosis. Okay, you are not going to apply any pressure. Naturally, if you leave like this, sea water in one compartment, separated by a semi-permeable membrane and pure water in another compartment. You leave as such. Now, the pure water will move towards the sea water because salt content is low here. So, from low concentration, solvent will move to the higher concentration. This is called osmosis. Now, what I am going to do? In the sea water compartment, I am going to put a piston and I am going to apply a hydrostatic pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. Now, what happens? Due to that pressure, reverse osmosis will take place. The solvent, remember only the solvent, water alone will be coming from the brackish water compartment to the pure water compartment, leaving behind the salt there itself. So, by this process, pure water will be coming to the pure water compartment and you can remove it as RO water, reverse osmosis water. Do you understand? So, reverse osmosis opposite of osmosis that is when I apply hydrostatic pressure in the concentrated side when two solutions of different concentrations are separated by semi-permeable membrane then the solvent will be moving from higher concentration to lower concentration. Hence, the brackish water is pure of you know, get, is getting rid of the salt and alone water alone is coming to the lower compartment and it is collected as pure water called RO water. Okay, so this process is simple, cheap and reliable and it is uh, used for removing ionic salts. Okay, advantages is uh, it is used to remove all the ionic salts although the installation cost is also high but maintenance cost is low. Only you have to remove the semi-permeable membrane which takes only few minutes. Okay. The semi-permeable membrane is made up of, see I forgot to tell that, semi-permeable membrane is generally made up of cellulose acetate, polymethacrylate, polyamides. Okay, these are the uh, polymers which are used as a semi-permeable membrane. And limitations if you see, the membrane cost is high and the membrane should withstand a pressure of around 2200 atmosphere. Yeah, I am going to apply hydrostatic pressure. It has to withstand that pressure. Sometimes that... Uh, that will not withstand this much high pressure, 
that's the only disadvantage otherwise this arvo method is a very good method to get pure water from brackish water okay so this is the end of our unit uh, water chemistry and it's very simple it's unlike uh, plus 1 plus 2 chemistry it's very related to engineering side and you can enjoy reading it thank you